Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence, rapidly changing, time-compressed environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. On this episode, I interview Fire Chief Gord Schreiner of the Comox Fire Department, located on beautiful Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Chief Schreiner holds the distinction of being one of the most impressive fire service thought leaders I have ever had the opportunity to meet. Let me share with you a little bit of his background. Gord Schreiner started in the fire service in 1975 and is the full-time fire chief in Comox, British Columbia, where he manages the Comox Fire Training Center as well. The Comox Fire Training Center hosts about 500 students per year and consists of four fire training buildings that are full of creative and innovative training props. Chief Schreiner is also a structural protection specialist and sprinklers with the Office of Fire Commissioner and worked at the 2010 Olympics as a venue commander. He also serves as the educational chair for the Fire Chiefs Association of British Columbia. In 2010, Chief Schreiner was named the Canadian Career Fire Chief of the Year. He was also presented with the Justice Institute of British Columbia's Award of Excellence. He has a diploma in fire service leadership, and has traveled both nationally and internationally, delivering fire service training. In 2013, he delivered fire service training in seven different provinces across Canada. He also writes for Firefighting in Canada magazine. He is very passionate about the fire service and is definitely a big advocate of paying it forward. On this episode, you'll learn about the Stop Bad initiative that's sweeping across Canada thanks to this one-man crusade being mounted by Chief Schreiner. You'll learn about innovative training ideas being used by the Comox Fire Training Center, including heating up their rescue dummies in a sauna to give them a thermal footprint, and how their training facility has heated doors to allow the imagers to show hot doors. You'll learn how they're using call signs for life and why that may revolutionize how accountability is being done. You'll learn how they're using the acronym TAP, Team, Air, Position, during accountability reports. You'll learn how they're using the SAVE acronym during size-ups, SAVE standing for Search and Rescue, Attack, Ventilation, and Exposures. You'll learn how the four C's of communication are improving situational awareness. Connect, convey, clarify, and confirm. And so much more. We start the interview with Chief Schreiner with me asking him how the Stop Bad movement got started. So let's get stuck in with this interview with Chief Schreiner. Well, Rich, uh, Stop Bad is really just a nickname of a program that I developed a couple years back called Safe and Effective Scene Management. And during delivering that program, I quite often use the phrase that we have to stop the bad stuff from happening on the fire ground. So um, a lot of the students and some of my peers have nicknamed the program Stop Bad. So the real name of the program is Safe and Effective Scene Management. Uh, But again, it's, it's recognized as Stop Bad. So why stop bad and why safe and effective scene management? Well, you know, I've been in the fire service almost uh, four decades now. Spent uh, the middle part of my career teaching a lot of scene management courses for local academies here, like the Justice Institute of British Columbia. Uh, Many of their courses were um, very good courses, but fairly cumbersome. And what I mean by that is, you know, five-day courses, $1,000 or more. 
And so about uh, 2012, I had a small fire department approach me and said, hey, Chief, uh, are you willing to put together a one-day program for us that's um, really meaningful, um, you know, very quick, you know, one-day program, no, no accreditation that we can uh, deal with with our own little department because we can't give up the five days of training or, or spend the money that's required to get these other courses. So um, I put together a one-day program and delivered it to the small department, uh, not thinking much of a future with it. And lo and behold, they too, told two friends and so on and so on. Um, in 2012, I got a call from the president of the BC Fire Chiefs Association to uh, meet with their executive to discuss this uh, little program I had delivered. Um, I kind of thought that they might be giving me some heck because I was kind of coloring outside the lines a bit and, uh, you know, being a bit of a maverick here. But lo and behold, they liked what I was doing and they offered me a contract to deliver 10 of these programs around British Columbia in 2012. Uh, these programs were attended by um, multiple departments at each session, so we probably had upwards of maybe 50, 75 departments attend in 2012. Nice. From there, we got more and more phone calls, or I got more and more phone calls from other departments saying, hey, we like what you're doing, can you deliver it here and there, and, and, and so on. So uh, over the last couple of years, uh, I've actually gone right across Canada from coast to coast delivering this program at uh, conferences and local departments and, and so on. In fact, I've been in seven provinces um, in the last two years alone. So, so that's kind of how the program got started. And the, the concept of the program is really simple, uh, simple concepts. How do we uh, go to a fire call starting at the fire station? Uh, Single-family home fire is what we typically deal with, and right down to the winding up the fire, the salvage and overall and everything, and, and touching on all those little pieces in between, <clears throat> but trying to do it in a very safe and effective um, system um, and, and really keeping things very simple. So, what are uh, what are some of the bad that we need to stop? Well, some of the bad things we talked about, and, and uh, you know, I should back up a little bit too. Part of my history is I spent a lot of time looking at the line of duty deaths and the injuries in the fire service, and, and we all know there's been far too many of them, and uh, and how can we uh, stop some of those things? So I often use the, the phrase, if it's pre or, uh, predictable, it's preventable. So some of the things that are bad are, are the way we drive the fire calls, whether we're a volunteer department or a career department. You know, we've got our volunteers often driving too fast in their uh, private vehicles to the fire station. Uh, so we talk a little bit about how we can manage that a little bit more effectively. And then we have uh, fire departments driving a little bit too fast to the instance sometimes. Um, and so a lot, mostly risk management type issues. So driving is certainly one of them. Uh, we talk about where to put the first hose line and, and the need to get you know, water in the fire fast. Uh, proper uh, PPE, of course, is discussed. You know, um, we I often talk about recipes. You know, what do we wear for a car fire? We wear a CBA, full PPE, and so on and so on. Um, ventilation is discussed. You know, uh, I I discuss at great length about working on roofs. Uh, you know, I tell our students do not work on burning roofs, and I know that uh, will bring up some debate in the fire service. But in modern construction here, you know, if buildings are burning way too fast, there's no opportunity to get on a roof and try to vent it. The, the fire will vent itself when it when it wants to, and the risk is just far too high to uh, to our firefighters to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, from there we talk about communication issues, how to talk on a portable radio, how to do uh, status reports, you know, how to do uh, uh, other types of communication. Uh, we do a piece on accountability, and that's been nicknamed uh, Call Science for Life. So we use a very simple accountability system in the program. Uh, we talk about rehab of firefighters, you know, the need to make sure our firefighters get rest and, and rehab and, uh, and so on. Uh, we talk about RIT, we talk about incident safety officer, we talk about uh, staging. And then uh, all of this ties into a big piece we talk about training, how necessary it is to do um, you know, adequate training to our firefighters and ongoing training. Um, you know, as you know, I, I love the training and we train, train, train all the time and I try to encourage departments to, uh, to do as much training as they can. So. There ain't nobody that trains like Comox trains. For the for the listeners, just get connected with them on their Facebook page and watch <laughs> watch how much training they do. Yeah, it, we, it is amazing. We do a ton of training, as as you know. You know, probably twenty years ago, we started a training center here in Comox. We now have four buildings on our site. Uh, we train other departments on our site here, so we have upwards of five hundred students a year come through our site here. And yeah, we're we're training uh, very aggressively a couple days a, a week. Um, you know, real scenario type based training. So you know, we have structure fires, car fires, victim rescues, and, and so on and so on. 
but again, keeping uh, things very organized, uh, very calm when we train. You know, although we're in an urgent business, we're, we're you know certainly not running on the fire ground, and we're doing things very professionally. So, so our department's really uh, dialed that up, and we do a, a very good job of that type of stuff. Tell tell the listeners a little bit about the uh, the training facility that you have there at the fire station. Well, the training facility we have is, it consists of four buildings. Um, again, built over the last 20 years or so, we have two towers. We have a three-story tower and a five-story tower. Mm-hmm. And we have a two-story um, live fire building that we call Mrs. Smith's house. It's really set up like a single-family home. Uh, again, in my past history, I've worked at other training centers where they have large burn buildings. And most of these burn buildings were set up more in industrial size, whereas watch student, watching students take in uh, hose lines or pulling in you know, a couple lengths of hose into a, a structure fire, and that's really not the norm in a single-family home. So we wanted to develop our our structure building here to represent a true single-family home. So in our fire building, when you walk in the front door, you're going to see a stairwell going upstairs. You're going to see a living room. Uh, if you go to the back, you'll see a dining room and a kitchen. Uh, there'll be a bathroom on the main floor. When we go upstairs, you'll see three uh, bedrooms and a bathroom. So very similar to what we would expect to find you know, in downtown anywhere. Um, and again, that just allows for our guys to... Uh, to train, you know, for our, our next call probability and, and the chance where we really can make a difference is in the, uh, the single-family home fires. Our fourth building on the site is a two-story uh, cold smoke building uh, with some movable partitions. Uh, this is all done uh, with cold smoke and, and searching techniques, so we do vent inner searches in there. We do all kinds of other searches in there. We have a high number of uh, props in there for using tick cameras. So, for example, we have a sauna for heating up our, our dummies that we use in there, so when we heat up our dummies and give them a thermal footprint. They look like real people on the tech cameras. Um, we have uh, microwaves in there for heating up bean bags that we hide in various parts of the building to, uh, to simulate those type of things and, uh, and so on. We, in fact, we even got heated doors in that building so we can turn on a timer and heat up our doors so with a tech camera you can spot the hot door versus a cold door and, and so on. Uh, none of these props are all that expensive. They're very simple, but again, it makes our training very realistic and, um, you know, with that realistic training comes a very well-trained firefighter and a very motivated firefighter also and this uh for the listener this training facility is literally on the footprint of your fire station what is the total you know i've seen training facilities that go over you know half a mile to a mile of space covered you got a pretty compacted yeah we have training a very facility site What's As you mentioned, it's right behind our fire station. Um, so our fire station is the fifth building on the site, which is the largest of all the buildings. Our whole site here is only two and a half acres, and the training component of that takes up about half of that. So, you know, an acre and a quarter, an acre and a half is a training component. We set it up kind of like a little streetscape where we've got two buildings on each side of a laneway that comes into our training area. So, again, it's very realistic. You know, truck placement is fairly re- realistic to what we would expect to find downtown anywhere. And, uh, again, very effective and efficient that we can do it right at our um, own fire hall here so we don't spend a lot of uh, driving time to get somewhere else to, to do this training. And um, do you ever get the neighbors complaining about smoke or anything like that? No, we, we're fairly well managed with our live fire training. And as I mentioned, we've been doing it almost 20 years here. Uh, we're primarily a composite fire department here in Comox. We have five full-time staff and 45 paid on call staff. Uh, so our training mostly happens in the evenings. Uh, we only use a live fire burn building in the uh, what we call the wet months here in British Columbia, so from October till April sort of thing. Uh, in the summer months, we don't do uh, live fire training, so you know, we spend six to seven months a year using that uh, a building for live fire. That, uh, that doesn't mean we don't use a building for other things the rest of the time. So uh, the neighborhood here has been pretty receptive to what we do. Uh, we're very interactive with our neighborhood and many other levels with uh, supporting them, and they support us. Um, and uh, if you knew our neighborhood at all, you would know that we have a school right beside us, a park uh, right beside us, a recreation center across the street, and a, and a residential neighborhood on the other side of me. So we're right in the thick, thick of things here, but uh, managing the center properly and uh, effectively has been uh, no problem with the neighborhood here. And you have other fire departments coming there and doing some training too? Yeah, we have dozens and dozens of other departments here uh, coming to our site. Um, in fact, we deliver live fire training here about 14 weekends a year for the Justice Institute of British Columbia, in which uh, we would have 12 to 14 students show up on a weekend, typically from you know a half a dozen different departments from all over Vancouver Island or other parts of British Columbia. 
And by the way, on Vancouver Island here in British Columbia, we have over 100 fire departments alone. In the province of British Columbia, we have over 400 fire departments. So, hmm. so they're keeping... Now, do you guys provide the instructors from your department, or do they come from other places? Uh, most of the instructors are from our department, very seasoned um, veterans that we have here. We have a very um, well-groomed and capable staff, well-trained staff. Uh, but we are using a few of the other local departments, too, to support our training center. So the other guys are here as co-instructors or techies or safety officers or whatever, you know, staff we need for that particular program we're running on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were going down through the list of the um, topics that you cover in your safe and effective fire seed management program and you got to the topic of accountability... Right. You just briefly uh, made mention of call signs for life. Now, I know that that is something that you have spoken a lot about and you have written about, but here in the States, that might not be a uh, a concept that is widely known. And mm -hmm. I, from my observation, probably not widely practiced. So... Let's uh, let's have you teach us a little bit about what call signs for life means. Sure, we'll explore that uh, idea a little bit. Well, throughout uh, North America, there's all kinds of different accountability systems, call sign systems, and, and so on. And, and you know, while some departments uh, you know, share the same, there's certainly many, many different ways to do things. So over the years here in our department, um, you know, many years ago we would use what they call the tactical call signs. We would call in a, t a team, attack one, attack two, search one, and those type of things. Uh, through running a training center here, we we kind of tripped over the idea that that wasn't working too well. And, and uh, to expand on that discussion, you know, typically we bring in a young student here to do live fire training for a weekend, and we tell that young student, so, you know, the first uh, call you do today or the first run we do, you're going to be attack one. On the second run, you're going to be attack two. Third run, you'll be search one, and so on. Well, lo and behold, by the time we did the second or third run of the day, the students would forget their call signs and mess things up for us, and it would uh, tend to put a bit of a wrench into the, the training. So our instructors came to us and said, you know what, we need to have a better system for out in the training area here uh, um, to keep this thing flowing properly because the students keep forgetting their, their uh, call signs. And, in fact, we would write those call signs on a big whiteboard on the training area so you could go and check you know, from time to time and, you know, but the problem was, you know, the students would be excited with the fire and, and, and so on, and they would just forget this. And it wasn't that we were getting st stupid uh, students or dumber students. It's just that, the, you know, with all the things going on, it was pretty easy to forget that call sign that we just assigned to you a few minutes before. So uh, what we did was start calling these uh, students by uh, either team designations or by a number. And we've seen it work so smoothly at the training center, and this is, again, going back, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that our officers then came to us and said, you know what, uh, if this is working at the training center so smoothly, it should work on the fire ground as well. So we started implementing it at, a, at the fire station here with our 50 members. Uh, and the concept here is that each firefighter gets a, a, a call sign number, kind of like you number your fire trucks. Um, so each fire department or each firefighter gets, a, in our case, it's a three-digit number, but some departments would use a two- or four-digit number, depends on, you know, the scale and scope of your organization and your mutual aid partners and so on. And so the fire department gets a number when he joins the, uh, the group here, and he uses that same call sign for every instant he attends, whether it's a car fire, structure fire, you know, any type of rescue uh, practices or, or whatever. And, of course, the concept is he's going to have a, a higher degree of uh, remembering that number. The number never changes with his task uh, and so on. So if two firefighters are assigned together, obviously, uh, in most cases, to do a task, for example, attack a fire, uh, they simply tag into an accountability system. Whoever tags in on the top of that uh, two-person team would be the call sign for that uh, that team. But uh, if uh, command cannot get a hold of that top person on the team, he can always dial down to the second person and call them on the radio. So it also takes advantage of the more portable radios we have in the fire service today. You know, Going back 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the average fire department had either no portable radios or maybe one per truck, and maybe the officer carried a portable in today's fire service, we're seeing portables in almost every pocket. So it allows us to take advantage of every player on the fire ground as an individual rather than as a, uh, a team with um, the one name for the whole team, and, and sometimes that can be very difficult. So, the, um, so then the um, onus of responsibility of knowing uh, which crew is doing which task 
then switches from the crew knowing what task they're doing to the commander having to keep track. Uh, in other words, command wouldn't, uh, if command needed the interior division one team, they wouldn't say on the radio command to, um, division one attack. He would, they would say command to two Oh three, if that is their call sign. Exactly. And that would be a partnership between the team and the, uh, the instant command. Uh, command is tracking this on an accountability board, so on his board would have the number assigned to the person. So our tags, our accountability tags that are stored on our helmets would have my number first with my last name behind it. And so command would tag me on, and, and for example, if you were my partner, you would be tagged below that, and it would say, Gordon Rich, you guys are doing fire attack on the first floor. Um, some may call that you know, Division One, and so on. Uh, but it takes away the confusion from uh, if you were to call Division One and have maybe two or three teams in the building all on the first floor that you know many would not know who to answer. And the other thing it allows for, if, if you and I were both called Division One attack and we were to get separated, it's going to be very difficult to call us independently uh, that call sign when we're in two different rooms and you know perhaps with two different radios, preferably. So it, it addresses all those issues, and again, we, we started it just for our fire department here. We thought it was just going to be something that, you know, uh, that we would do, and lo and behold, our neighbors found out about it, and uh, they wanted to get involved. And now in my region here, we have our 10 local fire departments all on the same accountability system. In fact, on Vancouver Island, I'd say we probably get about 50% of the fire departments uh, using the system now. And across Canada, we've got, uh, you know, I would say, a couple hundred departments at least uh, doing this. In fact, even in the States, I've heard of some departments doing it. Some of them don't call it the call signs for life, but some of them are using the accountability number. And in fact, a lot of departments are wearing um, a shield number on their helmets that identifies uh, themselves ind independently of the engine. So some departments will have an engine one tag, but other departments will have just a three-digit badge number on their helmet or, or things like that. So they're very close to using the system already. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I didn't mean to div to digress too much off of the uh, of of the class. So it, when you're teaching the class, um, I was taking notes. You were going pretty pretty quick down through mm -hmm. the list, but I'll I'll share with you the list back that I that I captured, and you tell me if I missed anything. So in the in the safe and effective scene management class, you're talking about driving too fast, uh, first line hose line placement. PPE, ventilation, communications, accountability, rest and rehab, incident safety officer, staging, training. Did I miss any? No, I think I think that's pretty much it. And as you can uh, imagine, this is a pretty full day to touch all these subjects. So in some of the training I do, I, we break these subjects out and do uh, independent uh, little programs on each subject. But uh, on a full day, we, we touch on all these things Um and uh, usually the students leave uh, fairly um, energized and refreshed that there's kind of better ways to do things or different ways to do things maybe be a better way to say it. For example, size up, one of the things I like to do with size up is I often ask the students, the first thing we really should be thinking about when we pull up to a burning structure is survivability. Is there anybody in that structure that could have survived what I'm seeing in front of me right now? Because after we ask that question, a lot of the rest may be a moot point. For example, uh, you know, building construction, all these other things are certainly important. But if we uh, first assess that there's no, no way anybody survived in there, then we're probably going to be defensive and you know, the rest becomes pretty simple. I often talk, too, about with the size up about different acronyms and stuff. And uh, we've shortened our acronym here in Comox to um, the word SAVE, S-A-V-E. SAVE, SAVE stands for search slash rescue, A for attack, V for ventilation, E for exposures. So we say when you do your size up, look at those uh, four letters that uh, spell the word save. That you uh, consider them all, uh, prioritize which, which you want to do. You may not do them all. And then that's a really good instant action plan. I know other departments are using things like ReVCOS and, and so on. And again, it's just a bit more cumbersome, a bit more confusing. Um, one of my uh, things I often talk about is the acronym COLE as wealth. And uh, you may have heard that, Rich, uh, before. It's a size up acronym for looking at about a dozen different things in your size up. But I often say to my students, you know, how many guys are remembering coal was wealth at 3 o'clock in the morning on a cold, windy night, you know, when stuff's on fire and people are yelling at you and so on. It's just, you know, a bit too too challenging to put right. that all together. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, under the uh, average person can 
um, in short-term memory, hold about seven pieces of information. Mm -hmm. So when you got the, I don't know how many is in Colwa's wealth, but there's got to be at least a dozen. And it just gets to the point where cognitively it's going to be overwhelming at at three in the morning. You've got it down to four things. Yeah, exactly. And the same kind of thing is with the call signs that we just discussed. As, as I mentioned, on, on a lot of fire grounds, you, you, know, you mentioned the division. So uh, my first run into the building, I might be division one attack. My cylinder runs out of air. I go to staging, get rehab. I get a new cylinder, and next thing I'm division two search. And so in the course of 15 minutes, you've changed my call sign a couple times, and then you expect me to remember that again at three o'clock in the morning when I got a lot of other things I'm trying to remember how to run the equipment and search patterns and, and on and on and on all my intuitive uh, training I've had um, we found over and over again that the students or the firefighters are forgetting these call signs we're getting multiple people answer for one call sign or nobody answering for the call sign and again the call sign thing just takes advantage of more radios on the fire ground mm-hmm. um, Often when we talk about the call signs, too, uh, people will say, well, why don't we just use a real, your real name, uh, Rich or Gord or your last name, or whatever. And the comment there is that um, if we use real names on the fire ground over the radio system, and of course that's picked up by our scanners and uh, can be on social media very quickly. Uh, and the other thing is that often we have many, multiple people in the same fire department with the same real names, whether first or last names. Or we have mutual aid department, departments that attend our calls where we can't pronounce the, the real name because it's what I call the alphabet name. You know, it's got 20 letters in it. I'm not sure which uh, how the pronunciation is it, uh, how it is, and so on. So, yeah. so again, the number system just works very, very simply. Uh, I, I often say to the guys, how would you like to not number your fire engines and just change the numbers as they go out to different calls? You know, <laughs> it would be very confusing. Well, and, yeah. uh, you, uh, you brought up a... a, a a point there that I hadn't really thought about until you said that, you know, multiple members from multiple departments could have the same last name. How do you manage having multiple members from multiple departments having the same uh, unit number or call sign from department to department? Well, that's very simple, actually. Um, we try as much as we can with the uh, mutual aid agreements we have in place here not to mul- or duplicate the numbers. But in fact, if they do, or if they are duplicated, then we would just use the city prefix uh, ahead of the numbers. So, for example, in Comox, my number is 355. If I was working with another group that had a 355, I would just simply call myself Comox 355 as opposed to Vancouver 355 or somebody else. Much the same as we do with our fire engines. You know, most departments have an engine one. So when three engine ones show up on a mutual aid call, um, you know, they sort that out, and it seems to work pretty, pretty well. So. So uh, as I said, we, we've been running this system for many years. Uh, there are multiple departments doing it here, and uh, we haven't found any flaws in the system yet. It works extremely well. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, how am I going to remember all the numbers of all my firefighters? You know, I have 50 of them here. And the answer there is quite simple. All you have to do is remember your own number, just like you have to remember your own name. If you can remember that, you can effectively uh, be, play on the fire ground and probably be safe. Um, and the rest will sort it out as the call unfolds because, as I often say to firefighters, you, you don't know what your call sign is going to be at the next call without the system. Mm-hmm. It's whatever your arrival uh, sequence is or whatever the task at hand would be. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense. It, it's, it's, it's so simple that it seems, it seems like, like it shouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we thought originally, and we kept playing this out. And you know, we're not a real busy department, but we probably run 700 calls a year. And again, we've got 10 departments in the area all running this, and we get together from time to time and talk about it. And nobody can find any flaws with it. We're all scratching our heads, going, you know, it's been years now. It's so simple. Why didn't we think of this before? In fact, I was talking to an old veteran a, um, a couple of years ago about this, and he said, you know what? We used to use a system like that before, where we had our badge numbers, which our call sign. But the difference was we didn't have any radios in those days. So there was very little communication on the fire ground other than yelling and screaming at each other. Uh, whereas today, as I mentioned, you know, we have a portable radio in everybody's hand. It doesn't make sense as an effective manager to have three portable radios on a team of three going in to do a search, but only having one call sign for that team. Because, again, if the team gets uh, busted up for whatever reason, uh, collapse in the building, separated, or, or, or so on, we have no way to really identify those other players on that team uh, where this system takes full advantage of that, um, and it works again extremely well. We've gone so far here in Comox that we've actually added the numbers on the firefighters' coats on their tail flap now. Rather than put their last name on the on the tail flap, we have a, their call sign number. 
our firefighters have asked not to have their names on their coats anymore because they're seeing their pictures too often on social media and, and so on. So our new uh, new turnout gear doesn't include names on it, just uh, numbers. And in fact, our helmets have a, a helmet patch on the front with their number on too. So they're really in, uh, invested in the numbering system here, and they love it. And, and on the front of the helmet, those numbers are... are uh... Uh, I don't know what the word is, iridescent, glow in the dark? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We just uh, upgraded them last year, earlier this year to glow in the dark um, numbers, which are amazing. So now when I look across a smoke-filled room or a, a dark room at another firefighter, not only can I see his helmet and the firefighter, but I know his call sign. Mm-hmm. Whereas, again, in, in other systems, when you're uh, whether you're a part of a division or a tactical call sign like an attack or a search, you wouldn't know what that call sign is by looking at the person. You would have to, you know, ask those questions. Right, Again, right, we, right. We can look at a firefighter, and I go, well, I know his call sign. And and uh, another another huge huge advantage for this is if I'm the instant commander and I see a firefighter walking toward me, I can look at his helmet number, look at my command board, and I know exactly what task he was doing and where he should have been. So I can already pre think of the questions I'm going to ask him when I get my face-to-face with him, Mm -hmm. speed up a bit of time and and so on. So it works extremely well. Uh, Again, you mentioned our Facebook page. If you looked at our Facebook page, you would see these call signs in play. Uh, I can't say enough about that. That's that's one of the strong suits of this one-day program that we're talking about. Um, It's worked extremely well. Even in our fire station with my five full-time staff, when we're calling each other on the intercom or on our radios around the station, we're just using the call signs now. They're not calling me chief anymore. They just call me 355 and mention it's a telephone call and so on. So it it simplified so many different things. The reason why they don't call me chief is because we actually have a fire chief and two assistant chiefs, and sometimes it got confusing when somebody said chief telephone. You know, three of us might answer. Oh, yeah. Every chief's a chief. Well, exactly. So but there's only one three five five. Exactly. So again, it works extremely well. So. Okay, uh, let me switch gears here for just a little bit. You had also said that in the program you talk about uh, communications, and I know mm-hmm. that uh, flawed communications is a a, a big uh, contributor to sure. um, injuries and casualties, and it and it has a it's a significant barrier to situational awareness. So. What are some of the things that you're teaching in the program as it relates to communications? Well, again, the concept here is to keep it simple but have um, systematic ways to talk on the radio. And, and a lot of departments, we don't spend much time training on radios. We go out and we, we do all the fire stuff. We hit the hydrants and pull the uh, pre-connects and put the ladders up. But the communication piece really needs to be practiced and, and, and so on. So we try to keep things simple. Now, I mentioned you know everybody having their own portable radio, so we could have a team of three with three uh, radios on it. Part of the training is that the team leader talks on the radio, the other team members listen on the radio. And they only talk, of course, if they get requested to. So everybody's monitoring the, the, the channel, you know, looking for their uh, their call sign and, and so on, but the, only the team leader is uh, talking back on the radio in most cases. But we've come up with uh, small things like a status report. Um, when I do my program, I usually will ask about three or four guys to do a status report for me. And, of course, in most departments, status reports will look different from every firefighter reporting back to you. You really need to package that or what I call can it. We, and, and so we do what we call a TAP report here, just a small acronym, T-A-P, like you're tapping somebody on the shoulder. And every TAP report really is here's your status report, and we're asking for um, your team, your air, and your position. So uh, how many on your team, how much air do you have, and what your position is. So very simple. So when I say to my firefighters here in Comox, uh, status report or TAP report, I get a very consistent report from every team in the building rather than, you know, some guys give you a long-winded one and somebody give you next to nothing. Um, now, oh, so, hold on. Give me, give me a, so if, if I were the uh, commander and I said uh, uh, 355 from command, TAP report, how would that right. sound? What would you say? So I'd re- respond, command 355, uh, three members, 50 plus floor two. And I would say I'm three members on the team, and command should have this information on his board already. Great, I'm so he's confirming two. it. Uh, yes, we're validating it. So mm-hmm. I'm on floor two, which is where command sent me. So ho- hopefully that matches up. The new piece that command wouldn't know is the air. And what we ask our members to report on air is not how much uh, PSI you have in your cylinder. We ask you two things. Are you 50 plus or 50 minus? And we're talking 50% of your cylinder. And the reason for that is if you're 50 plus, we may retask you while you're in the building to do another task. If you're 50 minus, we're going to withdraw you from the building and replace you with another team. So, for example, 355 status report, um, three members, 50 plus, floor two. 355, uh, do a secondary search, floor two. Okay, now the, the 50 plus or 50 minus, 
that's the air supply of the lowest member on the team? Exactly. It's, it's the air supply of the lowest member of the team, yeah. And we ask our team members to, or our team leaders to be um, caring for the rest of those members on the team. So he's constantly checking with his team members um, on their air supply uh, before they're moving forward, before they're going up another stairwell, before they're going to another room. You know, we have to constantly be checking those things. So it's a, a real uh, training piece of awareness of each other, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that seems to work very well for us. Now, do you have heads-up displays that show the air supply and the face? Yeah, in a piece? lot of cases, a lot of the departments now have the heads-up displays or bells or lights, or not bells, but lights on their air packs, which indicate those things, too. So it's a pretty simple process nowadays. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, and really, we do it with a thumb, thumbs up. The team leader will say, uh, hey, guys, air supply, and the thumbs up is 50 plus, thumbs down is 50 minus. If one member of your team is 50 minus, then you're probably withdrawing from the building, and we're going to replace your team. So. Okay. So again, pretty pretty simple, and again, the communication goes a lot uh, further than that. We talk about a communication model, and there's many models out there of how to communicate. Um, and we use a system here called the four C's of communication. So we use uh, four different words that start with C, and then we and the words are connect, convey, and clarify and confirm. So we want to connect with somebody. We want to convey or convey our message. We want to clarify that message and then confirm that message. So I'll give you a, a short example of that. Instant command calls um, 355, so it would sound like this, 355 from command, and the response would be 355. 355 would never say go ahead or, or something like that because we may not be connecting with the right person, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So we mm-hmm. always ask our, uh, our, our firefighters here to repeat their call sign when they're called, so that way we know that the connection is, is firm, that we're talking to the right party. Because, of course, if we're talking to the wrong party in the, in the building, it doesn't matter if we're using this call signs for life or... Um, divisions or, or groups or whatever else uh, people use, if you're talking to the wrong party, it could be critical that you're sending them into harm's way or, or other things with them. Mm-hmm. So we want to f- confirm that connection. So that's the first piece. Then we want to convey the mes- message. So in this example, 355, with, withdraw from floor two. In fact, even we, we've come up with a one-page uh, glossary of simple words like withdraw, so the fire firefighters would know what that word means and how to react to that word. But that's that's another uh, maybe another segment. Um, so anyhow, if the conveying of the message is uh, with 355 withdraw from the building. Uh, the clarification of the message would then be 355 is withdrawing from floor two. Command would then come back and say affirmative 355. So it's a very very solid connection piece. It uh, done properly. It's short, concise, um, and pretty much foolproof. You know the message is connected, conveyed, clarified, and confirmed. And and I would guess that when you're out there um, teaching this, you're teaching this to the departments that they're they're not doing anything like this at all. No, exactly. And it's, it's and you you'll see the light come on. You know, and that's one reason why I really enjoy this teaching and all these little things that we do. They're just all these little golden nuggets. I call them of, of how to really just simplify your fire ground. You know, the, the piece on the status report alone. If you were to ask ten people for a status report in most departments, you're going to get ten reports that look totally different. Um, if you're trying to do that in a, in a very efficient and quick way on the fire ground, which typically an incident commander wants to do, it can be very frustrating because, of course, the fire doesn't take a time out while you're doing this. You've got other things to deal with. The same with the communication piece. If you're talking to the wrong person or they're not understanding your, your uh, messages and, and so on, it can be uh, pretty challenging. So this is a piece we practice time and time again at every practice night. Uh, every practice night you'll hear us ask for status reports. Every practice night we'll be doing the four C's of communication. And if people aren't uh, following that, we we all bring them back out and, and do a little bit of lesson with them and, and make sure that they, they understand the way it works. Not complicated, uh, you know, fairly simple, and makes us very very effective on the fire ground. I think the, an important um, takeaway to this is that you're practicing this all the mm-hmm. time at sure. every kind of training scenario you do you just don't do this when you're having the big drill no exactly and and that's the and, and that's a really good point rich is that this and that's why that's what makes a good department good is that you have to practice this all the time you have to practice this at the small drill so when the big drill hits you don't have to do all this training at the, at the same time you can actually flow the the big event and and you know hopefully keep your people safe you know? well i was just having a conversation with a firefighter recently and i had, we got—I don't know what got us on the conversation, but I asked about their use of incident command, and he said, "Well, we only use incident command if it goes to two alarms or greater." Right. 
And I said, so if you have a single family residential dwelling with, uh, you know, three engines and a ladder and, you know, 20 or 25 people there, you don't use an incident command system. And he said, no, 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 we don't, we don't have to because it's, you know, it's real easy to manage because we don't have a lot of people there and there's not a lot of complexity to the incident. Sure. And I thought to myself, how many house fires uh, they they must have compared to the big one where they would use right. incident command, which would have all been perfect opportunities to practice and perfect the use of incident command. And somehow I think this person was lot into believing that if they don't use it nine times out of ten, that somehow that tenth time when they really needed it, that really big or really complicated event, that right. it's just going to bubble up and they're going to be good at it. Yeah. Well, I would say that's naive, of course. Um, you know, you need to practice this over and over. So we will run instant command on the, you know, the two-rig MVA that we go on, motor vehicle accident, you know, the small uh, pot on the stove, and so on. In fact, even our, on our practice nights, we run it all the time or any practice session. Um, and I should tell you, just recently we had a joint practice at my training center here where we had three departments attend, including our own. We had over 50 firefighters on scene here. What we did was set up three separate incident commands, like you might have in some community that was really busy in different parts of town, only we called the commands by the tasks that they were doing. So we had a car fire command, we had a structure fire command, and we had a search command because we had three different exercises we were rotating people through. We put all the students or all the firefighters into uh, staging, and then these different commands just threw resources out of staging as we would on a, on a real fire ground. So, of course, the firefighters come out of staging to be tasked to do a car fire. The command would explain uh, what his goals were and his objectives. This, the firefighters would go ahead and do that, and then they would be sent back to staging, only later to be called out to a different command. So we were exercising three different commands at the same time. Um, we had an incident safety officer that was shared with the site because the site is so uh, tight back here, one staging area and everything, and it worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet that... Uh that I'm interested in is are you in, in Comox, I'll ask this question from two perspectives of whether you're doing this and then whether you're teaching this when you're out teaching the uh, class is the role or the integration of dispatch into the communications component that are, you know, you're teaching and training. Does, is there a place for dispatch to fit into this? Yes, definitely. There's a place for dispatch to fit into it. In my particular area, um, dispatch doesn't fit as well as it might in others. Uh, in our dispatch center here, we're dispatching 50 fire departments with one or two dispatchers on duty. So sometimes it can be very challenging for dispatch to stay uh, on side on the channels that we're on. Our dispatch might be monitoring you know, 20 or 30 different channels at the same time. So it can be a bit of a challenge, but certainly we um, we want dispatch involved as much as we can. Having said that, um, we always run our own timers on the fire ground here. So we uh, we start a timer when we set up command once things uh, get going, and we run a 10-minute timer where we ask for status reports every 10 minutes from our crew um, or from our crews. I often mention to the guys if we're uh, still doing an offensive attack, you know, uh, by our second uh, status report, you know, 20 minutes into the fire, we really should scratch our heads and think about whether we're being uh, safe and effective here. That we still have people in the burning building, you know, 20 minutes in, and, and so on. So. Mm -hmm. It's also a good reminder, you know, that the building is decaying and that, you know, it might be time to, to call this off and, and reverse uh, tactics and go to a defensive posture. Now, when you say the status report, are you talking about the tap? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing a tap every 10 minutes. We do a tap every 10 minutes. And I also explained to the students that a status report is different than a roll call. If something were to go bad in the building, you know, explosion, collapse, so those type of things, then typically what we're going to do is say, all oh, units stand by for a roll call. And then all we're doing is just like in elementary school, are you here or aren't you here? We're just doing yay or nay. Uh, we don't need the status report at this time because we want to rapidly go through the roll call to determine if we got all the players. If everybody's in place, then we might um, do a, a status report from there. But really, as quickly as I can, I want to find out if all the people are still here or who's missing. Um, of course, if we're finding somebody missing, one of the things we found in the fire service over the years, if you find a team missing, you still have to complete that roll call because you could have team two or team three missing too. Uh, we've had situations in North America here in the last uh, few years where uh, people have done roll calls like that, found a missing team, stopped at that team only to realize you know, later on in the incident that they were missing another team. So mm -hmm. the roll call is quite a bit different than the status report. Roll call is a really quick, I call it down and dirty, uh, yay or nay, are you home or not? 
and the status reports, a little bit more information, but again, it can be done fairly quickly. Sure. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you, we've talked about the accountability. We've talked about the communications. Um, of all the things that you're teaching in that class in that day, and I can only imagine how packed in, uh, because you've got the meatiest of all the topics, just pick one uh, other area uh, from the list that you had provided to me and share a good tip or a good takeaway. Well, I think maybe going up to the top of the list, the tactics, and it, it, it surprised me um, teaching the 5D courses for so long. And, and we did the 5D courses mostly on the tabletop, but we did some live fire training scenarios too. And what I was watching unfold in these uh, larger courses was the how long it was taking to get water in a fire, whether it was a tabletop or, again, a live fire situation. And I found the officers were spending more and more time doing the management and the action planning and so on and so on, and nobody's putting any water on the fire. So in my tactical um, discussion here, that's one thing I'm adamant about, and one thing we train hard on is stretching the first line and showing water. And often that water is done from uh, exposure or, or done from the exterior through um, a vented window or something like that. So you know, get water in the fire as quick as we can. Uh, good, good recipe for the small town department, but it works well for every department. Um, you know, pencil fire, darken it down, or whatever term you're using, uh, protect the exposure on that side then, and then uh, look at your entry if that's what you're doing, if you're doing an offensive attack after that. You're supported by mechanical ventilation and so on. So usually that little discussion there alone, uh, I see the light come on with a lot of guys, and they go, you know what, we're, we're trying to make it too complicated. We're doing, we're doing the wrong things. You know, we're, we're, st- we're getting ready at the front door with two inch and a half. And, you know, meanwhile, the thing's venting out the uh, Delta side first floor window. By the time we enter, well, now we've got a, a roof on fire and, and so on. So, you know, again, keeping it simple, um, you know, the fire's not that smart. We just have to be a little bit smarter than the fire. And there's certain things that work, uh, generally speaking, you know, most of the time. So. Mm-hmm. Good, good. What a, what a, what a great topic. Um, yeah, again, you know, it's such a broad topic that there, there's a lot of good discussions. You know, we talk a bit about the ventilation. I often will say to the students, you know, uh, one of the examples I do give them is a vented kitchen fire on a Delta side floor one sort of thing. So we got flames coming out of the lower window. And I'll say to the students, what's going to happen when you open up the front door here and, and do nothing? Just open up the front door. And, you know, some of them will think for a bit and some of them will say, well, chief, I think, you know, smoke will come out of there and maybe eventually fire will come out of there. And I go, you know what, that's very predictable, isn't it? If we open up the front door, unsupport it with a fan or unsupport it with an attack line, guess what, fire will show up there eventually. And so, again, it's just one of those little aha moments is that, you know, if we're going to open up that front door, I like to do it with uh, mechanical ventilation, if appropriate, and we figure that out with our size up. But in in most cases, it would be appropriate. And then, uh, you know, quickly move in with a a suppression line and to contain the fire to the room of origin, which is one of our first tasks going in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. If... uh if someone were interested in hosting the safe and effective scene management class, how would they find you? Well, um, my email, which you probably can share at the end of your show here. Yep, I'll do uh, that. We are on Facebook, and I am also on Twitter. Um, you know, we do deliver this uh, all over Canada right now, and uh, certainly would be excited to to bring it down um, to our friends in the in the states here too um again this the program has been well received um you know a great program non-accredited but you know whole pile of meat and potatoes in in a very short period of time one day or or so well you know i can say that at first hand i've had the opportunity to to visit your department and and get to know first hand i've been to your training facility i i we toured it we walked through uh, and I got to meet your members and see what you guys are doing. And I told you then, and I continue to say, that I think that you have one of the most forward-thinking, progressive, safety-oriented, but yet still aggressive fire departments that I've ever had the chance to witness. And and you're doing so many things right, and I'm so glad that you're taking what you're doing right, and and sharing it beyond just the island. Right. 
And I'm so flattered to hear that from a leading professional like yourself. I mean, one of my uh, highlights of my career is get a nice letter from you, you know, explaining what you just uh, explained to me. And, and so that's rewarding for us. It also encourages us to continue to move forward with what we're doing. You know, we do think we're doing the right things right. Uh, we're, we're far from perfect like any department is, but we're, uh, we're doing a lot of good things. Uh, and this is all from a chief like myself who's just completing his 30th, 39th year in the business. I'm always looking for change. I'm reading the books. I'm on the website seeing what's new, what's what's out there, what what how can we make this business uh, safer? And you know, not change for the sake of change, but change for the right reasons. And uh, and so thank you for those comments. Uh, just a little tidbit with that, uh, Rich. Is, as you know, in our department here, we have one station only. I have three fire engines. I have eight tick cameras in this building. I have three tick cameras, thermal image, imaging cameras on my first outrig. So that's how serious we take the business. I want every team going in the building to have uh, thermal imaging technology with them so they can see where they're going. You know, that just makes us, again, that much safer and more effective. Yeah, and, and, and the way you're training with the, the, the cameras, with, you know, heating up the, the mannequins in a sauna and putting the bean bags in the microwave oven and, and you, you, you know, you're taking that thermal imaging training and you're making it realistic so that when they're training they're going to see that thermal footprint exactly. that of of the victim or the hot doors i mean that's right. just yeah, good we're taking stuff. It to the next level and, and just a little moment on that is you know, one of the things we do with our thermal imaging training is that's a separate component we do it's i start that out by sending two firefighters in the building and say hey firefighters you're looking for two victims in there take the camera and go look for them uh, and don't rescue them, just find them, come back out and tell me where they were. Well, the firefighters will come out and they'll tell me, you know, one was in the bunk bed and one was in the chair or something like that. And they'll say to those firefighters, how many windows and doors in that room? Well, I don't know. Well, did you see the burning ceiling? No, didn't see that. Did you notice a hot door? No, we didn't see that. So that's a really aha moment mm. for them. Students are saying, this camera is everything. This is your head on a swivel. When you go in there, you're scanning 360 in there, looking for all these thermal signatures, and they're all going to tell you something differently. They may tell you there's a hole in the floor, they may tell you there's a burning ceiling, and yeah, they may tell you there's a victim in there that you can rescue too, but uh, we don't want you rescuing that victim at your own demise when the ceiling's on fire or the floor is collapsed in front of you. So, so, so they, they need to use the cameras for all those things. So when you're sending them in uh, with the mission of, and you're, you're kind of pre-setting the expectations for them when you say, look, there's going to be two victims. You're going to go in, sure. you're going to use the thermal imager, find yeah. the two victims, come back out and tell me where the two victims were. You right. kind of set their expectations and they're going in and only seeing what they exactly were looking for and missing so many other things around them. What a, yeah. what a, what a powerful but, lesson. Yeah, and, and exactly. It's a great lesson, but isn't that real life too? I mean, that's typically what's going to happen. If oh, I yeah. say to two firefighters on a 3 o'clock in the morning fire, I say go to a primary search second floor, we're missing two victims. You know, they're not looking for those other things. They're they're amped up. They're looking for all these other, you know, they're looking for the victims. So so we really want them to use those tools as we want them to use the radios and the hose lines and, and so on, the way they should be used. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, well, we, we're, we're, uh, we're at the end of our time. So thank you for uh, coming on to the show and uh, and meeting up and sharing. I know it's been long overdue. I, I told you way back when I first started, I wanted to, to uh, have you come on. In fact, I'm interested in having you be a a uh, co-host. I just got to figure the technology out for how to sure. have multiple guests at the same time. But uh, yeah. this should have been one of the first episodes on the topic well, of safety. Well, as you can tell, I'm excited about it still, Rich, and uh, you know, so pleased on our friendship. And I, I can't uh, say enough about how I look forward to you and I getting together again, either back in Comox here or somewhere else. So. Yeah, I, you know, every time I get together with you, I, my head's just exploding from learning because I'm just taking it in and taking it in and taking it in, and and, and I tell you what, you're you're one of them, one of the uh, what I would call you a thought leader in mm -hmm. the fire service because you're you know you said you're finishing I think year 39 is that what I heard you yeah. say Yeah, I started in 1975. So yeah, and and for you, um, good enough has never been good enough. No, that, that's true. And, and you know, uh, one of the reasons um, maybe that I'm as outspoken as I am now uh, is I realized four or five years ago that my, I'm getting to the last part of my career, of course, so it doesn't really matter what I say now. I can speak up a bit more, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, when you're a younger fire officer, you're a bit tempted in what you say um, because you're worried about peer pressure and, and stuff like that. And I got to the point where you, I really just start saying, you know what, it makes sense to me. It's got to make sense to other people. Common sense has been my virtue. Um, when we start 
you know, yelling and screaming and sharing the message, and lo and behold, it's working. So. Well, that's it. Episode 26 is complete. That means SA Matters Radio is now six months old. Where did that time go? Thank you, Chief Schreiner, for taking time from your busy schedule to talk with us about the safe and effective scene management program. Thank you also for your passionate leadership to the fire service throughout Canada. Here's hoping your program may get picked up by some departments here in the United States. Lord knows there are many departments that could use a good dose of stop bad. Thank you, our listeners, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I sincerely appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. If you like the show, please, please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and search for SA Matters and subscribe and leave your feedback. If you like the show, I'd really appreciate if you'd give it a five-star review as well. Not only will that inspire me to work even harder, it'll help others find the show too. If you found any inspiration from this show and want to learn more about situational awareness, consider becoming a member of the SA Matters community. It's free. There's a red sign-up box on the right side of the homepage. Soon, we're going to be launching a new initiative where we're going to be giving new members a special report called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. So be watching for that on the homepage as well. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.